ever noticed how little things outside can make you feel just a little bit better? Like how when you step outside after a rainstorm and smell the crispest air, it makes you want to bottle it up and smell it forever. To get a more general idea, I did an Instagram questionnaire in my story asking, what are some of the first words that come into your mind when thinking about nature or the city? Here are some of the responses. Serene, fresh. Animals, trees, gorgeous scenery. Quiet, calm, overgrown plants and waterfalls. Calm, quiet, lots of trees. Trees, leaves, and plants. Clearly, there are some patterns in the responses with them using words that you would associate with positive ideas, such as trees and plants. These are words that you would use to describe calm settings that are filled with life. Now, let's look at the responses for what people thought of when thinking about cities. Crowded, bustling, sometimes very dirty, cool once in a while. Skyscrapers, lots of traffic, busy. Big streets, subways, convenience, people. Smoke, loud, high pollution. Loud, busy. Pollution, lots of buildings, little greenery, people. Most of these words don't convey as relaxing of an image than the words used to describe when they first thought of nature. The main ideas that were consistently brought up were pollution, buildings, busyness, and lots of people. In order for us to understand one of the main reasons why we are more relaxed when thinking about nature, we first need to take a step back and look at our history on this earth. When the humans first started to inhabit the earth, we used to live a more nomadic lifestyle, using up the land and then moving on when necessary. It wouldn't be a couple until a couple thousand years when humanity had the agricultural revolution. With the agricultural revolution, this enabled us to domesticate animals and farm with seeds, so we did not have to move around to get more resources. Instead, we were able to self-regulate our production of food and stay in one place. This meant that we could begin to develop societies and build cities, but even with this, we were still heavily reliant on the earth and we were still regularly interacting with the outdoors. Fast forward to the Industrial Revolution, and because of the second agricultural revolution and the onset of new discoveries for power creation, we were propelled forward with new technologies that would forever change the course of history and humanity. As a result, we started to rapidly change our environment by mass deforestation and pollution from factories. Incorporating nature into our lives began to be viewed as less a priority and more of an obstacle to progress. Nowadays, cities are hubs for humanity, but many lack one thing that really connects us back to the earth, nature. Although there are not many visible physical effects of this, research has shown that there have most certainly been psychological ones. Since there have been more cities built, most of our jobs require us to be inside working on computers. This has been especially true since the introduction of the pandemic, where we are now spending more time than ever inside. According to a video by Neurotransmissions, a YouTube channel by neuroscientists, the average American spends 93% of their time inside. Where before we could have interacted with nature a little bit on our way to commute, that is now gone and we can effectively spend our entire week inside, looking at screens for almost the entire day. This creates a major problem with the onset of mental fatigue, which is defined by Healthline as, quote unquote, being overworked or related to stress in the workplace. But mental exhaustion can also be caused by long periods of persistent stress in any area of your life. The main chemical that is responsible for stress is called cortisol, and cities have so many things that are constantly competing for your attention, such as giant billboards, the bustle of people moving to get to and from work, loud sounds of cars, but mental fatigue can also even occur with burnout from just working at your computer all day. These are all things that can raise your stress level and bring on mental fatigue. Although you may think that stress isn't a problem that it doesn't affect our economy, a 2015 study found that work-related stress accounts for $190 billion in healthcare costs. Just to show how impactful this is, I made my family do two experiments, where I made them listen to nature sounds and then city sounds for three minutes. What I was measuring was the change in my family members' heart rates, and I did the exact same thing but I made them look at 10 pictures of nature and then 10 pictures of cities. Then I measured their heart rates before and after, as well as having them fill out a Google form talking about how they felt when looking at the pictures afterwards. Before the nature sounds, the median heart rate for everybody was 81.8. After the nature sounds, their heart rate was 74.8 beats per minute. Their heart rates went down by 7 BPM just by listening to those noises. Then, after the city noises, their heart rates climbed back up to 80.6 BPM. This shows how just by even listening to noises that affects how calm you are. 
Next were the results of the pictures. 75% of the responses said that they felt calmer after looking at the nature pictures, and the median heart rate was 85. While all of the responses said that looking at city pictures made them feel a little bit worse than compared to the nature pictures, and the median heart rate went right up to 90 BPM. I still wanted to get a more professional and in-depth reason as to why we like nature so much as humans and why we are attracted to it. So I interviewed my aunt who got her degree in psychology at Ohio State and asked her why humans are so drawn to nature and why we like it so much more than compared. Okay, so you're asking me how being around nature calms your brain. Yeah. Or I would assume in that case, your brain activity, how it takes away anxiety, mm -hmm. or perhaps even depression. Um, it's very creative. You can look throughout all uh, vegetation in different parts of the world, different climates, and you're going to find thousands if not millions of different uh, vegetation. That alone combined with all the extra oxygen um, that provides to your brain that will bring some type of serenity uh, to your mind, to your soul in general. Um, also water, um, when I used to study psychology, there was a study that the sound of waves of the ocean are very soothing and calming to your brain. So if you are, you know, if, if you're like more on the spectrum of being a nervous, anxious person, and you go to the ocean uh, to meditate, just to uh, gather your thoughts, just put them all together, it will calm your brain. Uh, you can look at harvard.com, you can look at uh, Psychology Today and other different organizations that uh, they will tell you the same thing. It will calm your brain, it will slow down your process of thinking and in general you're going to feel better you know and also going back to uh, vegetation let's talk about flowers for a little bit when you can look at different flowers and see how they are made it takes away um, your focus from the issues that you are encountering on your everyday life and you're just like in awe with how beautiful they're made, you know, um, and that calms you down. Same thing goes with animals, let's say. That's why a lot of people go snorkeling because the ocean is just so beautiful and when you go snorkeling, you will find things that you've never uh, seen before in your life, if you're lucky you know, <laughs> enough, so that can calm your, your brain as well. So nature is a very uh, good way and a good alternative to um, especially people that have anxiety or PTSD to uh, calm their nerves or even for people that are busy you know we all get busy sometimes it doesn't necessarily that you are clinically uh, an anxious person or depressed but yes nature is probably one of the best remedies to uh, calm your brain uh, to help you process your thoughts and perhaps even live a more organized life without stress. Cool. As well as what my aunt said, there are also some theories posed by scientists as to why we are so attracted to nature. There are two main theories as to why we like nature so much. The first one being based on an evolutionary psychology standpoint called biophilia. Since our, nature, since our ancestors come from nature spaces, that we have a natural affinity, but this isn't all provable. The second is the Phi Co-Evolution Stress Reduction Theory. This theory also looks at our ancestors and that since they encountered resource-rich areas, that they would be less stressed and feel more safe, but it also relies on a hypothesis. Now that we have seen the negative side effects that mental fatigue has and what causes it, and we learned why we feel so much more relaxed in nature, we can truly see its importance. But one final major experiment was performed at the laboratory at the University of Illinois and they conducted a study where they compared the rates of crime from two different apartment complexes that were the same architecturally, but the only difference was the amount of vegetation that was around the complexes. The
result from this was that the complexes that had higher levels of vegetation saw an overall 52% decrease in total crimes, 48% fewer property crimes, and 56% fewer violent crimes. This, is, this was shocking because originally people thought that with more vegetation it would lead to higher crime rates because there would be more places to hide. But the complete opposite is true. This is because when there is more vegetation, people spend, tend to spend more time outside in these areas, and higher levels of supervision means that there is less crime. This also relates to how children were twice as likely to have adult supervision in green inner city spaces. Also, this might have to do with how vegetation can help with mental fatigue and lowering irritability levels. But not only can your environment infect you, but so does how much nature you grew up around it. A university in Denmark found that growing up near vegetation is associated with a 15 to 55% lower risk for mental health disorder. This was found using a huge source of data from decades of satellite footage and by using the Danish civil registration system, with over 1 million Danish people in the system. One of the reasons that this could be is just because, in general, green spaces encourage more social interactions and exercise and even a wider exposure to microbes in childhood could also contribute to this. The only drawback is that this is correlational and establishing cause and effect is very difficult, but still stands as a good point. Additionally, another study that I talked about in an article by the BBC found that children exposed to the natural world show an increases of self-esteem because it taught them to take risks and unleash their creativity, and it also gave them a chance to exercise, play, and discover. So now we can see how this affects regular people, but how does this affect people who are struggling with mental illnesses, and could being in nature serve as a way to relieve some of the symptoms? First, we can talk about some main things that happen in the brain with something even as small as looking out at a green landscape. First, your heart rate will go down, and then your brain will change from its sympathetic nervous activity to parasympathetic nervous activity, and that's like going from fight or flight into tend and befriend mode. And also, historically, the exposure of natural environments has been used for mental health treatments for a long time, and a lot of mental hospitals would be surrounded by acres of nature and land. Also, being exposed to nature can improve your well-being. A 2011 meta-analysis with 850 participants found that exercising in a natural environment resulted in higher feelings of revitalization than doing the same exercise indoors. Also, a 2012 study found that walking through nature for 50 minutes provided a mood boost and other cognitive benefits for 20 participants with depression. People with ADHD and anxiety also benefited from this. There is also a socioeconomic factor to this, and it can be seen by how in a study that was conducted in London, many of the neighborhoods that were there had their own pharmacy, and they found that there was a connection to the amount of greenery in a neighborhood and the amount of mood medications that were being prescribed. So, neighborhoods that had less greenery tended to be poorer, and also were prescribed substantially more mood medication compared to the richer neighborhoods that could afford to have greenery around that area. Spending time outside has multiple benefits for your psyche. For instance, I did a personal experiment with five of my family members where I first made them measure how they felt on a scale of 1 to 10 before, and then we all went on a 12 minute walk outside. Their average score before was 5.7, and then it went up to 6.8 afterwards. Granted, one of my sisters had her, her arm pretty badly earlier, so her score remained the same before and after the walk, but everybody's points went up by at least two points. But here are some other ways that I found that people used to get outside. First, I'm pretty sure we've heard the term mindfulness somewhere, but did you know that it can also be used when going on a walk in a forest? This is an actual thing called forest bathing. It's a practice that originates from Japan in the 90s. But what you do is that you go on a walk in a forest, but you use all five of your senses to become really aware of what's around you. Next, you can even use your phone, and I'm pretty sure we've all seen Pokemon Go and how suddenly all of the parks were filled with swarms of people trying to get Pikachus. But you can also connect with nature by downloading an app called iNaturalist that allows people to log their observations onto the map, as well as contribute to other people's observations. And it even tells you where the plants are, and you can find them along the map and learn more about them. Lastly, you can even find small activities throughout your day to bring more nature into your life, such as taking care of plants, which I have a crippling addiction to, walking your dog, or even just looking at your outside your window and noticing that the sunset was really pretty today, or that really chunky squirrel that always sits on top of your fence. I think now that since we have a more overarching idea as to why we are so attracted to nature as humans, we can now hold more value in spending time outside knowing the countless benefits that it has. So get out there and have fun.